So, so we're going to call Luann Neal forward. She's from the Kogutha Nation. She's also a repatriation specialist doing incredible work with the Royal BC Museum. And she's also an accomplished visual artist. So please help me in welcoming Luann Neal. I just want to acknowledge first and foremost my mom who taught me that. It took us a few years, it took me 30 years to get my down. But I'm there, I'm getting there. Um, I'm going to call uh, one at a time our youth panel members, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them as they're making their way up. If I can call uh, Giselle Martin. Giselle is a citizen of the Tleokwet First Nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island. She's a Nuchanoth language and culture activist and artist. Do I see Giselle anywhere? Oh. There she is, fantastic. Now Giselle's working as a cultural educator and an interpretive guide since 1993. Now I think that's amazing because it was around that time, just before that, that First Peoples, uh, the, the uh, act was passed, I think it was 1990-91, and I had the joy of sitting right in the next cubicle to the people who created First Peoples Cultural Council. So it's amazing to me that right around this time, this wonderful young lady was starting her work. Giselle's involved in the movement to protect and continue cultural lifeways within her community, as well as various language revitalization efforts. And she's obviously sought after quite a bit to speak at conferences and gatherings, and is an incredible, engaging orator with children and with new language learners. Now I hope I get this pronunciation correct. Skiljade White from the Haida Nation. I can get Skiljade to come up. Skiljade is a 23-year-old Haida woman from the Northwest Coast. She grew up on Haida Gwaii, where she encompassed a culture on many levels. She was part of a dance group since she was an infant and has been learning from her elders throughout her whole life. She's also surrounded by artists, and this has all had a big influence on the work she does. She's taken Haida classes from primary school right through to university. In 2015, she attended a four-month uh, Khadil immersion in Old Masset. And uh, in the summertime, she's working as a cultural guide in the southern Haida villages. Welcome. Good morning. And finally, I'd like to invite Jordan Brandt from the Mohawk Nation. Let's see if I can do this right. Kanyen Kaheka. Close? Oh, okay, I'm going to practice that today. So uh, Jordan is a teacher in the second year program at the uh, okay, here we go again. Ankwenna Kentiokwa School, which is a language immersion school. And I had a chance to look at uh, Jordan's video last night. I encourage you to have a look at an interview that he did online, uh, which talks all about the program that they offer. Uh, Jordan started learning the language in 2013, and after graduating in the program in 2015, became one of the teachers. So these wonderful young people, are going to share a little bit. Thank you. Let's welcome all three of them. I don't know if I, if I sit down, I might get too comfortable. Um, okay, you've all got a microphone. Okay, I'm just going to start and ask each panelist a question and get them to share a little bit with us. And uh, I know they have so much to share, so we're going to try and get as much in as we can. So I'm going to start with Giselle. Can you tell us about, uh, we, we understand that you were a participant in the uh, Mentor Apprentice Program offered by First Peoples. And can you tell us about what inspired you to learn your language? 
Uh, Amen. Um, I grew up speaking French and English, and nobody could understand me until I was five or six, unless they spoke both languages. And I realized when I was young that speaking in a different language, I felt very much like a different person inside. And I always wanted to learn our language. I went through a long phase where I thought it was impossible. I can't speak it. It's a dying language. There's nobody to talk to. Um, too many dialects. And um, I think one thing, looking back at my learning process, when I finally started learning how to write and label everything in my house and practice alone, that really encouraged me was working with preschoolers and just seeing their process of learning to say, mommy, I love you, instead of mommy, I love you. <laughs> and going, oh, I can do that too. I can. <laughs> you know? Thank you. That's terrific. I want to hear more about that a little bit later. Uh, let's go to Jordan. Jordan, can you tell us a little bit about what it's been like going through the process of learning and then becoming a teacher of the language? What sort of things did you bring to that? Thank you for having me here first. I was the backup guy, just so you know. <laughs> it's my last minute, so I'm going to do my best here. <laughs> uh, first of all, just some background to answer that question. Uh, at uh, We're an adult immersion school, and uh, it's, we just celebrated our 20th year. So it's been around for a long time. Uh, so, no. mm -hmm. so luckily by the time I got there in 2013, a lot of the hard work had been done. I just got to step into it, into a program that works. Uh, I was very fortunate with that. And uh, <clears throat> as, uh, as a learner, uh, you know, walked in, I walked in the first day. I didn't know anybody. It was very intimidating. People were already at a higher level than me. Uh, but it was... Uh, that the program works very well, and uh, I was able to be conversational after the first year. It's a full-time sem uh, school semester, so with 1,000 hours in class for one semester, and then by the time I graduated the second year, it was 2,000 hours in full immersion uh, with constant tests and all that soul-crushing stuff, I guess, <laughs> that works. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, luckily, when I, by the time I was hired on as a teacher, um, I, I had known the process that the students had gone through, and uh, that's uh, some days you're really eager to learn, and some days you're really not. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an instructor's responsibility to, to really understand that and to uh, push a student to do better when they're already down for the day it doesn't work very well. So, uh, luckily, I'm very fortunate to have gone through the program, uh, and I believe that's uh, really helped me in my ability to teach the program now. Excellent. You know, Thank you. Am I saying your name? Oh, yes. Thank you. Skiljade. Skiljade. I'm doing well. Okay. Skiljade. Can you tell us, first of all, I noticed that you were a recipient of the YVR Art Foundation Award. So uh, congratulations on that. I saw your piece. It was amazing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what it is you love about your language, and how has language, learning your language, changed you as a person? Um, so, what I love about my language, just in general, what it is, um, the hard kill Haida language is very descriptive. Um, when I learn it, uh, it's so different from English. Everything is backwards, but then once you learn more, you kind of realize that English is what's actually backwards. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and, but what I love about uh, the experience of my language is um, the connections that I make learning it. Um, I started at a really young age. Uh, I was really fortunate that my parents were really involved my whole life, so um, I had a secondhand experience learning from elders um, since I was just a little girl, and um, just learning from these elders and having that connection uh, was everything to me, um, and it had a huge influence uh, just 
um, having them as role models, and also the connections that I make with other uh, leaders and uh, language learners as well. So, yeah. Hello. Thank you. Leila Kaslan. So I'm just going to circle back around again, and uh, um, what I want to actually ask each of you to talk a little bit about is, um, from your experience, um, what sort of things do you believe prevent our youth from wanting to learn our languages? And we'll start with yourself. I, I personally was present, prevented for a long time by my own lack of confidence. Mm -hmm. um, like I said before, feeling like it was too hard to pronounce. There's too many dialects. I'm saying it wrong. Not seeing it, it, it was invisible or audible around me very often, so it felt kind of pointless in some ways. Um, but I, I, I want to take all that apart and erase it. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Jordan. Uh, so we're speaking to the challenges of yeah, starting uh, to learn. kinds of things challenge learn. youth to want to yeah. learn? Uh, in my own experience, my biggest obstacle was uh, the lack of speakers mm. when I was uh, little, I guess. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I was told at a very young age, hey, you need to pursue this, and I didn't want to. Uh, and uh, at the time, I guess I was just growing up. Um, so I went all through elementary school, that typical 45 hours a week, I think it was, we got Mohawk instruction. And then I went to high school, and a high school teacher told me, hey, you need to really pursue this. You need to do this now. And I said, okay, well, I'll get to it. And uh, then I got to university. And there's a Mohawk course offered in university by a person, uh, by a speaker from my home community. And he said, hey, you really need to pursue this. What are you doing? And I was in my last year of university. And he said, uh, <clears throat> uh, so I said, oh, well, I want to go write my LSATs. I want to become a lawyer for land claim negotiations. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that was four years of my life, but OK, I guess I'm. <laughs> I threw that away. <laughs> so I guess just being told, I had to be told constantly from the time I was little all the way up until I was in university, this is what you have to do. I didn't just have one person telling me, I had a community telling me constantly. Um, so I guess the biggest obstacle was just uh, I needed the time. I needed the time to really grow into it, and I needed that constant community support to start it. That's excellent, thank you. <laughs> Never give up on reminding our young people that there's a reason for this. Skiljate, what challenges do youth face? Um, so, thinking about it, I think a lot of the youth, um, well, for me personally, I feel like I have to gain fluency right away. I feel like I have to get a word right right away. And um, I think a hard thing is like being discouraged that way. Um, and But you need to realize that like not everything happens right away. And um, having a support system really helps a lot. Um, can I say one another challenge? <laughs> I think that um, this day and age too, you know, with all the different activities we like to do as human beings, we don't always have um, language there. I think that something that could really help youth would be to um, uh, open up things that they like to do and have it, you know, um, have the language there available to them in that way as well, so, yeah. Oh. Wonderful, thank you. And that's actually a, a really good segue into my next question, which is, with all of your experiences, what kind of advice would you give to not only other youth, but the organizations in your communities that are working on language revitalization? What 
sage advice can you offer to them to keep youth interested? We'll start with you, Giselle. Make it fun. Um, I think to start out, it's really important to make it fun and be willing to play. I had to be willing to play by myself a lot, to practice in my car alone, to um, graffiti around our village. <laughs> Um, and, and don't get too caught up in, in you know, the, the how-to sometimes. You know, we can really spend a lot of time examining and thinking about curriculums, and that's really important work too. But at the end of the day, or the beginning of the day, we actually need to start out speaking the language. We need to get out of the bed and think. And one thing I like to practice sometimes is making lists. If I'm going to make a grocery list, try write it in my language instead of English, even if I'm in a rush. And if I'm having, um, if I'm journaling, I found if I'm having a bad day, I, if I try to write it in our language, I come to a completely different conclusion than if I was doing it in English. Um, so just try to bring it wherever you go. And in the beginning, I found it hard to um, find people to speak with. And so I said, well, all these non-native people are living in our community, I'm just gonna speak to them. So I went to the bank and, <laughs> Oh, don't give me my money. But that, that playing and, and being light about it led to people, non-native community, being like, hey, let's get language on the radio. So, you know, it really helps to just be playful about it and, and let people in. Excellent. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> let's ask Jordan. Uh, so this is advice for the organizations themselves yeah, starting out. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, I guess uh, for an organization to be successful in uh, creating speakers, it needs a, a clear goal and it needs a plan. Uh, as for my own language, it's polysynthetic, the Mohawk language, meaning that over 90% of the vocabulary are verbs instead of nouns. Uh, many organizations focus on things, colors, naming things, right. which is, uh, in our language, we're addressing only less than 10% of the language when we do that. Right. So as far as creating a speaker uh, capable of waking up in the morning and going to sleep at night and in between living in the language, that's, uh, that's not feasible. That's not going to make us speakers focusing on that aspect of the language. So <clears throat> having a, a clear-cut plan, uh, a curriculum developed, um, as well, be prepared to, don't be afraid of change. Mm. Every single year we tear our curriculum apart and say what didn't work and what worked. And in that same thought, be prepared for absolute catastrophic failure <laughs> <laughs> every single year. And don't be afraid of that, embrace it. Yeah. I got one woo back there, I guess that's okay. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> uh, so what, uh, what we uh, really try every year is say, okay, this worked during the summertime here in between our semesters. Uh, this is where we really tear everything apart. And we say, we're going to change this and try this constantly improving. I believe the number one, uh, number one killer of our languages right now is complacency. We reach a state where we're complacent with our... <laughs> with our... our uh, current fluency levels or a current number of speakers or the way things are because it's manageable now for in the classroom. But uh, every year we have to improve and we have to change it and we have to keep pushing with it. So, uh, as far as uh, a new organization starting out, have a plan, be prepared for failure and be prepared to change. Excellent, thank you. Um, it's really hard being the third person to answer the questions. Um, what I was going to say was to have fun too. When I was learning uh, in high school, my one of my mentors, Chinny Steven, he'd always encourage us to just have fun and um, learning from the elders. I swear we'd be laughing all the time. Um, but another thing too um, for organizations um, to direct it towards youth, I kind of already said this, but um, just to have different 
activities because you know you want to keep that interest there and um, give them something they like to do you know make them go outside you know do land-based learning um, and do things that involve culture as well I think um, for me what really encourages me to learn language is um, just practicing my culture and be and like feeling that my um, how do I say just just knowing who I am because of that I think that's so important to youth and that's what encourages a lot of us too so how, <laughs> oh, how do you say that in your language <laughs> that. <Yeah. laughs> it felt like your language wanted to come out there when you were describing that yes and we have we do have to get better at just doing that I think that's wonderful um, we've got about uh, we still got lots of time. We've got about 15 minutes. So what I want to do is, uh, first of all, these young people are just amazing. I, I sat up late last night looking them all up. Aren't they amazing? <laughs> because I don't need as much sleep these days, I don't think I ever got much sleep. Um, I looked them all up. I went on their Facebook pages and I <laughs> stalked them a little bit. And I gotta tell you, I, I'm so excited to just share this stage with them. So what I'm gonna ask each of them to do is to talk a little bit about uh, whatever they would like to talk about that comes from their heart. Uh, Giselle is out on the land a lot, and I think that that was a beautiful statement from Skiljade about go out on the land. So, so I want you to share a little bit about that, and then Skiljade is a, this amazing artist so I think that being able to talk about how your language influences your art and vice versa. And then with Jordan, um, something you mentioned on your video yesterday that I watched, um, when you were talking about the way curriculum is developed typically in language programs. So that's just uh, something to think about, but if you wanna talk about something different, we'll do that. So now you don't have to be the last person to speak. <laughs> I'll invite you to talk first about your art and the language. Okay, hello. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just start by talking about um, the project that I did this year. Um, I completed a project for the YVR airport in May. And um, when you first apply for this, uh, you have to say what you're gonna make and you know be pretty specific and so this was probably way over a year ago that I applied and I had to think about what I wanted to create and um, you know, being influenced by growing up with a uh, song and dance, I wanted it to be something that kind of reflected uh, who I am and, um, and I wanted it to be something that uh, is usable too. So I ended up making um, a miniature, like a child size bentwood box drum. Um, and, you know, like just things like that. Like when I make art, I really, um, now I really want it to, you know, come from somewhere and I want it to um, hold the stories that I've learned. Um, uh, on there, I have the crests of my clan, so the, a bear, a raven, and a two-fin killer whale. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> I'm losing train of thought. But yeah, I think everything just uh, reflects back on each other. I don't really, I think uh, putting myself in a box is really awkward for me. <laughs> and. Um, but, you know, everything bounces back together, language, um, songs and dances, um, my culture, gathering food, it all moves around together. And um, it's, it's kind of like, I'm not really trying to say, oh, I'm this or I'm that, but it's um, just what I enjoy doing. And um, I'm learning from everyone I can. Um, from my family, my dad, he he helps me a lot, and my mom, she, my mom is a, a language teacher as well, so I hear all these stories from the both of them, and I'm just trying to do it justice, you know, like, if 
they, you know, and my elders too, if they give me all this knowledge, I just want to do the best I can to um, uh, carry that forward and, um, yeah, give um, respect to that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful. Let's go to Giselle next. Out on the land, I feel like I've been in a lot of meetings the last few days, um, thinking about fish farming and logging and the future of our lands and waters and the air. Um, but even though I might be indoors and in meetings, I feel like the land follows me with language um, because it is an ecological language. And when I listen to what we're speaking about in English and then I think about it in our language, it shifts and it changes and it becomes so much more powerful and stronger what, and clearer what, what we need to do and how we are connected to all the life that supports us and our culture. Um, when I was doing Mentor Apprentice uh, with Levi Martin, my mentor, um, I was really busy and he was really busy too and I ended up doing dishes a lot and it's like made up songs about dishing, making di dirty dishes and clean dishes. But <laughs> when we finally got outside, that's when our language came to life. When we were walking in the forest, when we were walking on the beach, it really, really came to life. And all these new words flowed into our conversations, new I'm going to say N-U-U, not N-E-W, new, like new channel words. They're old words. And um, it, yeah, it's really important to take the time to be outside and listen because it is an ecological language. Our words come from the land. They come from the life in it. And that's one thing that I was told when I was younger, too. I was always interested in our songs, our history, our stories, plants and stuff. And uh, one late elder I used to visit, Mary Hayes Mitt, um, you know, sometimes she didn't have the answers to my questions. I still can't find the names of the constellations in our language, and I'd get really sad and bummed out, and, oh, we're all dying, it's all getting lost. And <laughs> she told me one day, she said, don't worry, as long as we can protect the spirit of the places, the plants and the animals, we can relearn from them directly from them, because that's where our culture comes from. That's where our language comes from. And finally learning, beginning to learn our language, I'm still learning. It, I really, really see that. And just the other day, I was running on the beach. Oh, I did get on the land. I went for a run. And I walked past a cove. I can't find its name in our language, but I've decided in, in my heart, I, I call it Tishlupnit, which is place of octopus because the octopus beaks wash up just in this one little corner once a year, and the, I saw the seaweeds were starting to wash up, and I'm like, oh, I know they're gonna wash up soon. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I realized I haven't examined this word teeth loop. I just think, oh yeah, teeth loop, octopus, octopus teeth loop. But then looking at the word fragments and the meanings, and, and our language is very verb-based and descriptive as well, and it got really cosmic. My thoughts got r suddenly really cosmic, thinking about what is the meaning of teeth loop octopus and how they oxygenate their eggs, and it's connected to our ceremonial dances and our history in the last ice age, and it was amazing! <laughs> so get out on the land. That is amazing. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Jordan. So we have an artist and on the land learning. I get to talk about class, <laughs> uh, school, okay. <laughs> I'll try. Well, I'll just... talk about anything you like. How about kicking down the okay. walls of the school? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'll try to make it interesting. <laughs> uh, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, as far as curriculum development goes, uh, which is, again, as sad as it is, the focus of my life right now during the summer months, uh, how can we do better? How can we teach things faster without sacrificing comprehension and um, basically becoming more efficient at what we do? And it's uh, really become my life. And uh, luckily, I have a great uh, uh, 
boss that we work with every day. I work, work together every day to just come up with what we can uh, to change things every day. Um, with Gunyogeha, again, we talked about how it's polysynthetic, meaning a verb-based language, and uh, with that, meaning that there are as many words in the language as there are sentences in English. Mm. So we're limitless. Mm -hmm. So this approach of learning one word at a time uh, with an unlimited vocab lexicon, is uh, we're not going to get anywhere with that. So what we really focus on is teaching patterns and giving students a foundation. And it's this foundational learning that's going to set them up for success. So they can, again, go on to learn what they need to learn, what they want to learn. Uh, and every day within our classroom activities, we have uh, our morning routine and our afternoon routine. In our morning routine, we start out. We have uh, every student stands up and talks about how they're feeling that day and what they did the night before and anything else that they want to say. And we start that on day one. And on day one, with a student with very little background, little to no background in the language, they're going to stand up and say, Sego, meaning hello, you know. Uh, and they'll sit back down. And so we can actually watch the progress as we go into the class about how much more they can say, how much, how much more comfortable they are. Um, and it's giving them this foundations for when they complete the first year. Moving into the second year, the tempo goes up, and we provide them with more and more vocabulary uh, to conjugate words. And by the time they're done, they have a toolbox of um, a, a very strong foundation uh, so they can put together anything that they really need to. So when they start to spend more time with first language speakers uh, and then get into their art, get out on the land, do the cool stuff, that's where they're really going to uh, be able to follow their own path and become the speaker that they want to be. Um, yeah, that's about everything I have to say about that. That was cool. <laughs> Thank you. So just as we're winding down, I just want to invite each of you, because I know you have so much more to share with this audience, um, whatever final closing thoughts you'd like to share about uh, ways that uh, youth can become more involved or, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. I won't structure that too much. Just out. Um, I, I grew up being told that our culture is an oral history, that everything's passed down orally. I like to say passed up now instead of passed down because it's not something that we just casually carry and drop down to the next generation. It's something we have to uphold and it takes work. Um, so I really want to thank all of you for carrying, carrying that forward. Um, but the oral, oral history, um, our art is our semasiographic writing system. It's not glottographic, but it's like our writing system because it's so symbolic. And so really, it's inscribed in our art. And that's tlis tlisa is our word to write, but it means to inscribe in a meaningful manner. And that's what we can use for painting and drawing as well. So it says it right there in our language. But also, our art reflects the natural world around us. And it reflects all these teachings from every single plant and animal. We don't just get material goods from them and medicine and food to use. It's not a use-centric approach. We get teachings about how to live, and that is in the art. So really, our library is in the land. And that's, that's what we have to protect. And when we protect language, we can protect our land and vice versa. Excellent. Thank you. That's such wise. It's all interconnected. Uh, what, what would you like to say in closing to this wonderful group of people about uh, well, anything under the sun or um, advice or direction? Oh, jeez. Okay, so, um, yeah, I think that, you know, we're all here for a reason. We're all here because we're interested in learning our language. Um, take that little spark and, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard. Like sometimes, well, in my community, um, we don't always have something going on 
um, just because of, you know, things like money or programming and stuff like that. But if you can find, like, people or one person, someone else who can uh, learn with you, then that helps so much. And learning in a group together, I feel like uh, you get so much support and inspiration um, just to keep that going and don't don't be discouraged. Um, and yeah, and that's to the youth too. Is like, I know every we're, I know there's so much inspiration in our youth to learn the language, and there's a lot of fear too. But we have so much out there, and just to take advantage of that, and um, to be brave, and um, to be together too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Talk about cool stuff, Jordan. No. <laughs> uh, I guess the one thing I could say in closing is, uh, as a language learner, as a teacher, as someone involved in the language, be patient with yourself. Um, especially with my, my own language experience, uh, is uh, very, very different than English. So when we get into the amount of time in an immersion setting it would take to become a speaker, we're looking at about 2,500 hours roughly to become an advanced level speaker, uh, which is what our goal is, is, which is what we're trying to accomplish in 2,000 hours in class. And uh, within that, uh, again, speaker, new students are coming in, and it's very difficult, and they're becoming overwhelmed. And we, I just wanted to say, be patient with yourself, and be patient with your other fellow learners, because it's not just a two-year classroom. It's going to be the rest of your life. And if you're going to become a speaker, you have to make it your life. And we are going through, we go through 2,000 hours in class in a small classroom with the same group and the same teachers listening to each other's voice every day, <laughs> looking at each other's faces. We very, very quickly become a family. And families love each other very much. And what else do families do? Or my family, anyway. You know? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so uh, when uh, again tensions can rise within the language, be patient with yourselves. Be patient with each other. Uh, we have to make it our life if we're going to win. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the three of you are just amazing. I'm a big fan, and and I friended you. Friend me back. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to reflect for a moment on what, uh, what our wonderful leader Lorna was talking about earlier about that shattered mirror and, and the artists amongst us can really relate to the idea that piecing together that shadowed mirror is making one of two things, a mosaic, which is a thing of beauty, or a kaleidoscope that gives us so many different views on the world. And I think that's who we are, and that's who these young people are. So I just want to, on behalf of uh, First Peoples Council, just raise my hands in thanks, Gela Kesla, to these amazing young people. Join me in thanking them for their time. Okay. <laughs>